Hi, I'm Ray. And I'm Ashley. And, and February's, February's What's Neat, Neat starts right now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. This is What's Neat for February 2021. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we have a father and son team, Austin and Steve Allard, share with us their brand new layout that they've spent the last six months building. This is a double deck layout designed to run long trains, and it's really neat to see their fit and finish that they've got prior to scenery on this layout. Also this month, James Regeer shares with us how to build a four beacon stratolite beacon for his HO scale locomotives. This is just like the beacon that we've seen Rapido come out with in their model, whereas there's four separate bulbs that flash and create that rotating effect that we see on the prototype. It's really interesting to watch James Regeer show us how to write code and make it seem very simple to have the end result that we want for our model. We also feature some magnificent drone footage from our new drone pilot, Dan Schneidel in Modeling Ideas from Above, where he shares with us that big boy locomotive 4014 running through its countryside in all of its glamour and beauty. It's a real treat to see the footage that he has filmed for us this month for What's Neat. Also this month, I'd like to thank all the folks that do watch the What's Neat This Week podcast every Saturday. We bring it to you and we share with you all the new products in the hobby from the big companies and the mom and pop companies alike, along with special guests that we get to share their passion for this, the best hobby in the world, model railroading. I'd also like to thank Lombard Hobbies for sponsoring the What's Neat show. A few of our podcast members have made purchases from them in the last month, and the service has been second to none. It's been great, and including myself, I'd like to say thank you very much for the great service that I received. So if you've got purchases to make in the hobby, check them out at Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobbies.com. So now let's, let's continue on with the rest of this February 2021 What's Neat. For this segment of What's Neat, it's our first layout interview since COVID has started. And I'm standing here with Steve and Austin Allard. You'll remember them from the podcast. At least Austin, you've been on the show a lot. And I remember one show that we did for What's Neat, you were with Rand Hood and you guys were discussing layout design and you got a lot of good information from that, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. Um, I remember standing in his living room talking about cornfields and saying how I thought they were boring, but that's all changed now. So we're standing in your brand new layout. Before, before we talk about this, I wanna talk about your old layout because we've got some good video clips of that. And of course, this has always been a father and son team, which is the magic of model railroading. It's part of it. But you guys had a really neat layout down here. There was miles of track. It was kind of in the middle of the room and on the outside of the room all at the same time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was kind of hodgepodge together. And it went through what, about six or seven different versions. And it just it, got it to originally the point. started like this as the exterior, and then we kind of moved it inside, as he said, and just changed it and changed it and changed it. And finally, I, I'm like, you know what, enough is enough. We were, we've kind of realized that we're never going to get the scenery. Um, we're never going to actually do the exterior walls as you should with, you know, drywall, and tore it all down and said, let's do it right. 
So now you've been building this layout since December and we've got some construction pictures that we've shown off in the show. You've literally studded out all the basement walls and finished them. You sprayed the ceilings black, it looks like. Yes, you've carpeted this whole area and all the bench work is built on the wall and it's double level. Explain to me why this layout is double level, Steve. Well, Austin can have the top level and the, one of the things that we want to make sure of when we develop this layout was that we didn't have to exchange trains on the same track or have we want everything totally different so he got the space. top i get the bottom mine is smaller because i just don't have as i guess as many trains to put on yard tracks and things like that so it works out great for me and great for him that's really awesome this layout is magnificent in that you can run really long trains and that was your point wasn't it oh yeah i always like running long trains it's what i think is accurate Normally, I would ask you what's the minimum radius, but overall, tell us what are the general radiuses on this layout? Um, a lot of the corners are 48. Um, there's one corner back there that's 70. There's a couple other ones that are 60. But with running longer trains, you definitely need a wider radius to get physics. Obviously. And you run two trains at once here? Yes, yes, very much so. Double main line. Now, I noticed the top layout is DCC because Austin, that's what you do. And tell me, how's the bottom layout powered? Well, right now it's just DC, but I do have a number of feeders going around and I have the wire and we do have another system, right, that I can yeah. hook up. So mine will convert over to DC. Uh, I wanted to run my new engines that I got and they don't have decoders in them and I don't know how to put the decoders in that well. So I thought I'll just run them and kind of get that out of my system before we start building some more. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to help him with putting decoders in and uh, we got to wire some more feeders, but that's easy to do. On this layout, I decided to wire, we got like doorbell wire, and I wired the feeder to the rail joiner and then drilled holes. So lots of learning with this it's one. It's amazing. So tell me, there the two levels now, what are the height of each? The top level, the top of the foam here is 53 and a half. And I believe yours is 14 inches below? Yeah, so... So that would be 39 and a half? Yeah, closer to 37, I think mine is, so, but mine is not as deep, so I don't have, I can't crawl in as deep, so there's a false back there, and I, just enough to, you know, be able to run two tracks through and put some scenery in the front, and I'll be happy. What's that false back? Is that masonite painted blue? Yes, and then I just put two by threes, I screwed them down, and I figured it so when I dropped the styrofoam in that a two foot wide or a 16 inch wide piece which i get three out of a four foot board will fit in between that board and in between this so i have a kind of a lay nice good now steve well, you were telling me that you had built some storage into this layout why don't you show us some of that yeah i have a i put a number of uh drawers in here go to lowe's and get these really nice drawer slides i started over there and I realized that you can't make them out of two by threes because you can't fit boxes in them. So I've made all the ones that'll go down here. And they'll be all two by or one by four thickness. So I have a little deeper thing. So when I'm done with the train, I can stack it away. You know, and I have a number of different areas and a number of different drawers that each has their own different train in it. So these drawers replace the fact that Austin on top has built a switch yard, but on your layout down below you haven't, is that right? Correct, yes. So, and I'll have two small side tracks on the back side. I have a little deeper back there, but they really aren't enough to hold a full train. Wow. Now we're gonna look at the layout drawing and you said that Jeff Meyer had drawn this layout plan for you, Austin, and we're looking at it right now. You've got a lot of scenery and a lot of buildings and structures to build, don't you? I sure do. Um... There's gonna be a nice river section that I'm sure he's running B-roll of right now. There's gonna be several different interlocking towers. Um, in fact, if you go right here, in the middle of the yard, there's gonna be a yard tower like Dupo, but I'm only gonna build half the tower so that you'll be able to look, as you're standing here, you'll be able to look through the windows and be able to see right into the yard as like Jeff Meyer would be able to. This is absolutely amazing. Another question I've got in my mind now is to describe the type of trains and what era is it that you're going to model? 2013 uh, Union Pacific Jefferson City Sub. And that explains the Labity coal train that it we does. see and a lot of auto rack trains. Yep. 
yeah, I got uh, symbols for them all with the help of people I know at the railroad. Um, there's a couple guys I know um, back in the day, 2012, 2013, the era that I'd like to model that videotaped everything that went by and they posted it to YouTube. So I literally went on last week, typed this train symbol into YouTube and just floods and floods of videos came up. And I'm like, this is, I'm, I'm grateful for them now that they did that because it makes it a whole heck of a lot easier to model. This is absolutely amazing, Steve and Austin. You guys, as a father and son team, I mean, come on, get together, boys. <laughs> it's really, it's the magic of the hobby that you guys can share this hobby together. And oh, what you've built here is absolutely awe-inspiring, and it's going to motivate a lot of other people out there to build layouts. Well, great. That's, Thank you. We're happy. We're very, we're proud of it. We're happy. We did a lot of work. We got to this point, now we just feel like running trains until we get enough energy and mental capacity to start doing scenery and other things. We've hit a couple lulls so far, but I think mm -hmm. to go this far in a year, we've, we've done pretty good. Yeah. Is there any shout outs you wanna give? Cause I know you had a lot of help on this. <sighs> yeah, shout out to the Bofodens for helping, plumbing, uh, Steve Mantia for the electrical, Raymond Brown for doing a lot of the help with the wiring and a lot of other stuff. Thank my dad, because he's the best. Dave across the street. Dave he, across the street. He kind of taught with. us how to do. <laughs> yeah, he, he do joints on wall board. The wall board is, instead of putting your four by eight horizontally, it's vertical. He came through and just took the joint compound and one roll, and it's that's what it looks like. So I'm, I'm pretty amazed. There's a lot of people. I'm sure I'm forgetting people, though. But one thing about this layout, we were able, this design that Austin came up with, we were able to put an area for seating, we have a bathroom area, we have our desk work area, a little refrigerator down here. So it's become more of a social place to gather as well as run trains. Guys, I say it all the time. This is in fact the best hobby in the world with the best people in it, just like Austin, Allard and Steve. And so that's this segment for What's Neat. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm James Regeer, and for this segment of What's Neat, I'm going to show you how to animate a prime stratolite rotary beacon on a locomotive using 0402 LEDs and an Atmel Tiny 13 microcontroller chip. Now, lighting rotary beacons convincingly has been a challenge in model railroading until recently. Uh, most were based off of flashing or di and dimming patterns using a single LED or incandescent bulb. And as decoders have advanced and as DCC has advanced, manufacturers have actually tweaked this pattern to achieve better realism. But because the rotary beacon has still been a single LED, it lacks the rotation without a certain amount of imagination. But what if we could take four LEDs and put them into sequence because a regular stratolite was actually four incandescent bulbs that were sequenced to fire off in, in sequence so that it looked like a rotation. Now Aaron Heine actually worked on this problem and he developed a kit to upgrade rotary beacons on HO scale locomotives with four LEDs several years ago. The kit used a microcontroller chip that Heine had programmed to flash the LEDs in sequence, just like the real Stratolite. About a year ago, Rapido became the first manufacturer to offer a functional 4 LED rotary beacon with the release of their B36-7. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to get this locomotive and what am I going to do with the rest of the locomotives in my fleet? They're not going to quite look right with their single flashing beacons, are they? I knew how to program an Arduino, but what if I could transfer that to something smaller that would fit in a cab? Well, let's get started. The first thing we want to do is build our circuit, and we'll do this even before we start programming the Arduino, and because this is where we're going to see the results of our programming to make sure that we're on our right track. So the first thing we need to do is interconnect the grounds on our breadboard. And you see there's one black wire running from the one side to the other. Both the Arduino and the ATiny13 chip have a common cathode arrangement. This is the opposite of a decoder. And so while I like to use the blue and positive function common on the decoder for my resistors, here I'm actually going to be using the common cathode. So. Uh, that's where we're going to put our four 1k ohm resistors for our four LEDs. Next let's add the ground from the Arduino to the breadboard. Then let's wire pin 13 to LED 1, pin 12 from the Arduino to LED 2, pin 11 to LED 3, and pin 10 to LED 4. Then as we're adding in the LEDs I'll just briefly mention that it helps to use five colors in this all the way through and that's one thing I wish I would have done because when we're getting to the magnet wires when we're actually installing the tiny 0402 LED rotary beacons it's a little bit difficult to keep them separate and collated in order to get the right flash pattern right away and so that adds some frustration to the project so if you can find five different colors of magnet wire that would be the best way to go about this. So now that we've set up our circuitry, it's time to go ahead and go to our Arduino sketch and look at how we're going to write this program for the Arduino. So the first thing we're going to lay out is our constants and our variables. So we're going to set up our integers or the INT. Now the these will be LED1 equals 13, that will mean that LED1 is linked to pin 13. LED2 is equal to 12, meaning it's pin 12. LED3 to 11. LED4 uh, to 10. Now we want to establish lengths of time here. We're going to write variables called longs. And each long will be assigned a number of milliseconds or millis. And the beauty of setting up the time as a variable early on in the process is that later on if we want to tweak it we can simply do that right at the variable level rather than f hunt through the entire program looking for numbers to change. So we're going to say long on time to represent the length of time each beacon will be on. And we'll set that at 200 millis. 
In principle, this would be good enough because we're dealing with four lights that will flash in succession, and therefore, in theory, there should be no overlap. But wait a minute. These are all incandescent bulbs that we're representing here, and incandescent bulbs have a warm-up time and a cool-down time that one needs to take into consideration. In other words, they don't switch off instantaneously. So we're going to say long transition on and set that at 50 millis. And then we're going to add long transition off and set that at 125 millis. Next we have our void setup. And this is where we tell the Arduino what each pin will do. And in this case, all of our pins are output. So we type pin mode and then open parentheses LED1, comma, output. And we do that for each of the four LEDs. And that's our setup. Next up is the void loop. And this is a series of equations and instructions that tell the Arduino what to do. And the void loop will actually repeat an infinite number of times as long as the Arduino has power. The first thing we want to do is to establish a couple unsigned longs and these are things that change over time to let the Arduino know that it is to keep track of the time and do certain things at certain times. So the first thing is unsigned long. Current millis equals millis and this simply means that we are going to be using the Arduino's internal timer and that we are telling it to act at certain times when the uh, value of millis reaches a certain amount. So then the next line is unsigned long, time difference equals current millis minus previous millis. The rest of the void loop is a series of if slash else if slash else statements. So first we're going to look at LED1. So we say if the time difference is less than or equal to the on time plus the transition off, then we will digital write LED1 high. In other words, LED1 starts off high as long as, as, long as it's the on time plus transition off or less. Now, then we write else if time difference is less than or equal to four times on time minus transition on. And if that condition exists, then we write LED1 as low. And finally for LED1, we write else if time difference is less than or equal to four times the on time. Then we digital write LED1 as high. And the reason for this is that we have that transition on that we want to add to LED1. And LED1's transition on has to come at the end of the cycle. So now we move to LED2, and there we say that if the time difference is less than or equal to time on minus transition on, then we digital write LED2 as low. In other words, we want LED2 to start the cycle off. So next we write else if time difference is less than or equal to two times on time plus transition off, then we write LED2 as high. Then finally we write else if time difference is less than or equal to four times the on time, we digital write LED2 as low. Now you'll notice there's a pattern here and we're always sort of bumping up the multiplier by one for each LED. Um, and that continues on through the other two LEDs, and we're not going to go through that in detail. I do want to note, however, that LED4 has its transition off actually at the beginning of the cycle, uh, much like LED1 has its transition on at the end of the cycle, meaning that we write if the time difference is less than or equal to transition off, then we digital write LED4 as high. And finally, we say else and then pre previous millis equals current millis and so what this does is remember previous millis has been cycling up and up until it's four times on time and that's the length of our whole cycle so that's where we tell it that it needs to equal current millis so that we restart our cycle now i'll make this whole sketch available and hopefully with the information that i've given here you'll know how to tweak it if you want to do so 
Once we have the sketch written down, we can transfer it to our Arduino and breadboard combination, and we can give it a test. And if the beacons flash to satisfaction, then we are done with the programming portion of it. If not, then we go back and tweak it. Once you have the program written to your satisfaction, then you can go ahead and get your ATINY13 chip ready for the burn. We talked about this a little bit with the Trackmobile project, and the process of getting the Arduino and breadboard ready for burning the ATINY13 chip is very much the same. I'll put up a link to the website with the tutorial for this on the Model Road Hobbyist article. As for the program, there's just a slight modification necessary. Go ahead and change the pin numbers from 13, 12, 11, and 10 to 4, 3, 2, and 1, because that is where they are located on the ATINY13, which only has 6 programmable pins. Now with the ATINY13 all programmed in, we're going to look at how this needs to be wired up to fit onto your decoder. Now, looking at this diagram, we see the blue wire, and that's the function common coming from the decoder. Now, we also see that through a 1K ohm resistor, it's going into the, into the uh, first pin of that ATINY13. Now, if you have a decoder that already has the resistors in it and is LED compatible, then you don't necessarily need this 1K resistor. You can just simply go into the uh, positive pole of the ATINY13. But we have that in here just, just, uh, just in case. The green wire, of course, is coming from the function wire of your decoder. And you want to have this function on your decoder set to constant on. And then, off of the, uh, off of the function wire, you have your, uh, your resistor, a 1K resistor, going to your LEDs. Now remember, you have the common cathode on this decoder. And then from there, we go from pin 1 to LED 1, pin 2 to LED 2, pin 3 to LED 3, pin 4 to LED 4. And there we're set up. Once you have this established, you can continue on to soldering your 0402 LEDs onto wires. Now here I'd say you want to solder the wires as neatly as possible and do it so that they both go to one side of the LED. In other words, you're going to want to solder the blue wire to the positive pole of your LED and have it directed so that it comes out the bottom of the rotary beacon with the LED standing on its end. Then you'll want to do the same for your negative uh, wire so that it comes out of the end of the rotary beacon. Unfortunately, this part of it is a little bit too small to do a demonstration video effectively. Once you have the LED sets soldered together to the wires, go ahead and paint them generously with silicone conformal coating. Now this step will actually serve to insulate the LEDs from each other because the wires would almost certainly be touching inside that tiny LED dome otherwise. Give them overnight to dry. You can then take the wire ends and plug them into your breadboard in the same alignment as the LEDs that you're testing. And your new rotary beacon lights should fire right up. So the next thing you need to do is to prepare the prime straddle light beacon detail part. I usually like to use the ones from Athern Genesis. And this is the same part that Athern uses for its Genesis locomotives. And in fact, in this case, I'm using the same beacon detail part that came with the locomotive. Now my first step is to carefully drill out the rotary beacon to widen the hole with a 1 16th inch drill bit. I then widen it a little bit more with a 3 32nd inch drill bit. Remember we're trying to accommodate four LEDs in that very small space, so a little bit of widening is necessary. Now what I also found in sort of an aha moment was that I wanted to take a number 60 drill bit and drill a little dimple into the top of the dome in order to accommodate the wire ends. Of, uh, of the LEDs. And that's something I'd not thought about before, but once I made that drilling point, the LEDs actually mounted a little bit better. And with that, it's a matter of soldering your wire ends from your LEDs to your ATINY13 terminals, 
and then uh, soldering your ATiny 13 and wiring it to the decoder of your locomotive. And there you have your rotary beacon completed. All the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. Thank you.